You know when you watch a boxing match in between rounds, you always see this ugly fellow with hair as white as all of Antarctica. A complexion similar to bowl of porridge and a gut so huge you'll need professional mountain climbers to reach the top just so they can remind the dude what his toes look like. And he looms over these muscle-bound specimens, guys who look like Atlas with punching gloves, berating and slapping them about as if they were children who just spilled milk on the floor. That's me. Although I can see my toes just fine. Francis Achiai is the name, although you can call me Franco. You're probably wondering why some old fossil is writing on the internet where they tell spooky stories, right? Well, because I got something spooky to tell. I ain't much of a writer and I don't care for it, rather live my own life than some other in a book, you know? But something happened to me, it was like a dog's age away from now that I never told anyone. So I heard from a young boxing friend whose eyes are glued to his phone rather than his sandbag that there is stories people put on the internet about frightening experiences they had to let the world know about. What I got to tell is a boxing story. When you think about boxing, there's only so many ways you can tell it and the Rocky films cover all the bases. But this story isn't about a champion falling from their insurmountable plateau or an underdog cliché. This is a real story I saw with my eyes and felt with my body. And I tell you, this no sleep story will make sure you never wink for as long as you draw breath. You should be thanking me I'm writing this at all, my hands have arthritis and I'm sick of these red and green lines telling me I'm wrong. I know how to spell my surname, asshole. So, let's take it from the top. Before I was a coach, I was that Atlas with 12 ounce gloves. Because of my surname, people called me the Axe Man. I know some of you are looking my name up now on BoxRec or something and trying to find me, but don't bother. The people that called me that was either friends on the street or thugs who knew me too well. My name was never announced in the ring. The day before my professional debut, I got into a bare-knuckle fight I didn't want to get into at a pub in London, ended up with a retinal detachment or whatever excuses the doctors gave me. This was on the night of June 1982, and I was only 22 years old. I was supposed to fight Frank Bruno, who instead fought Tony Moore and won. I could have been that loser. All those years of dreaming and training my body was wasted in 20 seconds just because I spilled some beer on someone. I kept having this dream ever since, where I'm in my boxing gear, the trunks for my professional debut. Standing in front of me is Frank Bruno, and I'm within reach of him, but my jabs don't hit him. It was as if he moved an inch away, and no matter what I could do to get him, I can never reach him. My 20s that I wanted to spend as a boxer ended up being spent in whatever crappy, tedious jobs you could dream of. The closest I ever got to boxing was watching it on a box, and couldn't even afford a ticket from time to time. In 1989, my father who I was looking after passed away. He lived his life the way he wanted to, taking so many gambles knowing he could either win or lose it all. I spent my prime getting pissy about what happened to me that night, thinking it was a door of opportunity forever closed. But I had an idea, a gamble. So I took it. I sold my house, all my possessions, and my car, hell, I even sold all my clothes. The only thing I couldn't sell was my pet parrot, Eubank. This was before Chris Eubank was big, but because I know you'll all ask, yeah, later on I did give my little parrot a monocle. So with nothing but my parrot, the money I made and the clothes on my back, I opened a gym. Franco's Gym. I don't use much of the creative side of my brain, but it sounded friendly, like a hangout for aspiring boxers. I had some good fighters here and there during the early 90s, all different divisions, but none of them ever made it to a world title. Hell, I couldn't even make it to the top rankings. It kept me afloat for a few years, but I knew if I didn't find something soon, I'd be drowned in debt. Then the day came. July 5th, 1995, my 35th birthday. The best present I could ever receive walked into my gym. Six feet nine, muscles like iron covered in skin, legs so long I counted two steps from the entrance to the front desk. He asked me if he could pay for just a day's membership, and I said sure. Saw him to the bag, and despite the sloppy stance that boy could punch. One lazy jab, and I thought the bag would explode. Everyone else in the gym stood still and watched him work in awe of his raw power. 
I walked over to him when he was taking a break and started chewing the fat. He never really had interest in boxing, just had a lot of frustration and didn't want to take any of it out on another person. I asked him if he had any goals, he said no. I told him next, what if your goal would be the heavyweight champion of the world? He laughed and said the chance of that happening would be one in a million. I told him he was one in a million, fists the size of sledgehammers, but faster than a shooting bullet. I said you're sloppy, but I got the knowledge to match your power and together, we have a combination to throw the world off its axis. He stared at me for a long time. Eventually, though, he smiled, said, yeah, sure, why not? And at that moment, I felt like the 22-year-old me, who was excited to take the first step to becoming champion. Now I had a second chance through this young man, capable of standing up to or even surpassing the likes of Tyson or Lewis. I asked him what his name was. He said Braddock Manson. I told him in a few years time Braddock Manson will be announced the new king of boxing. Braddock smiled and stuck out his hand. It's a deal. I remember the trembling feeling that a young man's grip, knowing the power in those muscles, could knock out anything or anyone in their path. I sort of felt this immense tension in my body, you know? I was afraid of what could happen to his opponents, weeks in hospital, retiring early, or even death. Then damn Eubank yelled something that broke the tension and made us both laugh until we pulled every muscle. Wanna know what he said? He said, champ. Champ. God damn it. I had to take a break from writing. I feel like an eagle using its talents to try and write. So anyway, Braddock and I didn't just stand around talking about how great he's gonna be. I got him training right off the bat and not a second was wasted. Road work, shadow boxing, weight training, skipping rope, footwork in sand, any possible form of training any boxer had ever done, we did it. I even got him to chase a chicken around every now and then. It's been helpful for a lot of old school heirs, but it's so damn funny to watch. September comes around and Braddock's body is already showing improvements, muscles showing up where they weren't before. But he looked exhausted, both body and mind. He keeps asking me when we're gonna stop running and start fighting. I told him if you want a well-done steak, you gotta give it time to cook. Clever as he is, he didn't want a steak. He wanted someone's blood on his boxing gloves. I remember thinking that if his jab is as sharp as his tongue, he won't need many matches to reach the top. I didn't really have a business plan other than training. I never was a promoter. But one thing I know about business is that you get opportunities, whether you get them yourself or they land right in your lap. Our opportunity came walking through the door, punching the same bag. Right, so let me tell you about this guy a little bit. Sometime after I started the gym, this guy who looks like a bank accountant comes walking in and asks if he could buy the yearly membership. I said sure, he pays me in cash and then takes off his blazer. Doesn't change into gym wear, doesn't even take off his tie. He punches the bag a few times. Then he leaves. He's been doing this ever since. Same suit, same bag, and same amount of punches. He'd do this once every five or six months and stay for a total of five minutes every time. But he'd always pay yearly, and I didn't want to ask questions. He was keeping the gym afloat. So I'm in the gym with Braddock, working the mitts and breaking the arthritis in my hands. Mr. Suit and Ty comes in, takes off the blazer, and does the same one too, doesn't beat on the bag. Then he does something he's never done before. He turns around and watches us. He comes over to the ring and we stop and look at him. You never told me you was a coach, he said, acting like we've been a band of brothers this whole time. He asked if we had any matches coming up. I said we've just met and started training, haven't thought that far. He told me he's a host at an underground boxing club, kind of a rinky-dink setup, but good for amateurs looking for a fight. He had a match coming up tonight, but someone bailed at the last minute and wondered if Braddock felt ready, if he would like the chance. We looked at each other. Then we looked at him. Freak it, we must have both thought, because next thing you know we nodded at the same time. He said wonderful, gave us the time and the place, and walked away. Didn't even pick up his blazer on his way out. 
A few seconds pass, we finally look at each other and start cheering, hollering, destroying sound barriers all over. We were cheering as if we had already won the fight. The remainder of the day was spent having a rest, going over a rough strategy, never mind that we had the faintest idea of who the opponent was, could have been Popeye for all we knew, and laughing about Mr. Suit and Tie. Not that it matters to you, but man, I only ever heard him once and hearing him again, you know when you dial a number on your phone and you get that machine voice? What do they call it, automated? He sounded like that, but with an accent. And the way he walks. I didn't notice until now, but he marches instead of walking casually. What a character. How little we knew back then. Tonight's the night. That Neil Young song kept playing over in my head as we walked to the venue. It was as cold as any London night could be, but the buzz kept me warm enough. I'm not going to tell you what the place is called or where to find it in case some nut thinks it's funny to go there. But it looked stripped down, barren, as if it's been closed for decades. We were getting worried we came to the wrong place, though maybe it was a setup. Then the front door opened and out came a behemoth of a man. Have you ever watched that show, Dog the Bounty Hunter? He was like that, but with more hair. Like a lion wearing all black and fitted with a Bluetooth earpiece. We walked to him, asked if this was the boxing venue. He didn't say a word, just let us right in. You couldn't tell from the outside, but the place was full of life. We walked down the steps to the sound of music, crowds. It wasn't until the last step that we saw the sea of people swaying their bodies to the music as if possessed. We saw flesh clinging onto flesh, hands exploring where they're usually forbidden. Braddock asked me if we walked into a match or an orgy. I couldn't answer that one. Mr. Suit and Ty came to greet us, walked us into his office away from the ravenous crowd. I noticed that he had a slab of beef covered in wrapping. Saw it before he managed to stash it in his drawer. It looked like he'd got it from the butchers just a few minutes ago, which was kind of funny. After all, how many butchers do you know that opened past 5 p.m.? He explained that the match was like any other. You have a set number of rounds and you win either by knockout or by the judges, one of those being himself. He asked the U.S. how many rounds we want to go. For being the minimum and 12 usually the maximum, but it could go longer if everyone involved was willing. I knew that Braddock felt like he could go 12 rounds, but every cocky fighter feels that way until they get hit for the first time. I said four because the opponent could tire him out in the later rounds, when muscles like Braddock's could turn into weights pulling him down. He asked if we were sure because longer rounds meant more of a payday. I was wary. He sounded like a cat trying to convince a mouse to be willingly eaten alive. I said four rounds, final. It was then I noticed his intense glare, the only time I ever saw something human in his face. With that sorted, we signed the contract for the fight so we could be entitled to the money. And with our signatures on the paper, there was no backing out now. He shook both our hands and wished us good luck, prayed that we didn't leave it to the judges. After being shown directions to the dressing room, we got set up. Braddock got in his gear and started shadow boxing. He was really pumping himself up. We didn't have time to get trunks made, so I lent him the trunks I was supposed to wear for the Frank Bruno fight. They fit like they were made for him. Not a surprise, I guess. His physique was similar to mine. I like to think that if it weren't for the color of our skin, people would have mistaken us for twins. While he was preparing, I got sunk into deep thoughts about that night, wondering why I was thrown off my path in life before I could even take my first step. I began to think it was because that path wasn't for me. I had to wait until Braddock came along to walk that path and I would guide him through. Boxing can be like walking through a dark forest, never knowing what lurks and waits for you. I was the axe man that cut down the lurkers for him. I get his gloves on and suddenly he starts getting the shakes real bad. What if I lose, he asks, and I notice he's starting to cry. I tell him to look in the mirror. He does. Look at the man staring back at you, crying and shaking with fear. Look at him for a long time, I said. When you look away, that babbling fool will not be there anymore. When you win the fight, look in the mirror and you'll find a man on the other side that knows what it takes to win. Every victory you get, 
that man will be with you. Every step you take, you're getting closer to him, the man you want to be. Leave this sorry sight behind right now and start heading towards the man you were meant to be. He looks away from the mirror, the sorry sight of a man disappearing with him. He heads through the corridor and into the light. I smile because he has already done more than I was ever able to do. He took the first step to becoming a champion of the ages. Braddock was the first to walk through the crowd as the announcer introduced the new challenger to them. They booed before the announcer could say a word. They must do this to all the young bloods that come in, but in the ring it's all the more better when the challenger knocks the other guy out. It's how he gained his first fans. Now, when this other guy comes through the crowd, they praise him like the queen strolling through the street in a carriage. I couldn't quite get a glimpse of the guy as the crowd was swallowing him up when he got on that stage. My God. I can't think of any word other than flabbergasted. I'm going to tell you now, there was plenty wrong with this man. Here's the first two things I noticed. He was twice as small as Braddock and twice as pudgy. Even with that extra baggage on his gut, there's no way he could have been heavyweight. Maybe middleweight, super middleweight at best. I start to notice more details. It was as if the match was fast forwarded for him already. He was sweaty, out of breath, looked sick and ready to fall onto the floor before the first gong rings. His hair was black on the sides, but white from the top. The streak went all the way to the back of his head. The announcer said he was from South Africa and had 150 amateur fights, all by decisions. How could all those fights be decisions? In what world does anyone have that kind of record? Braddock whispered in my ear that he wouldn't let this one go to the judges. I smiled. Oh, and another thing, the announcer called this guy some name I couldn't pronounce, but said his nickname was Honey. What kind of nickname is that? I remember wondering if this was a novelty match we stumbled into. We go into our corners. I'm telling Braddock that this guy looks out of breath, but it might be a tactic. Just take your time and play around with some combinations. I wasn't much for imagination, so I stole from the best. We use the number system Demato taught to Tyson because it's easy to remember and easy to make good combinations. Gong rings, first round starts. Braddock took it slow, getting into rhythm, taking a few jabs from Honey, learning his style, his timing. Most of the fight he just clinched, trying to waste seconds worth of points. Guess that's why they call him Honey. That crowd was the most ferocious I've ever seen. It looked like any second they would break into the ring and rip those boxers to shreds. There was more rage outside the ring than in it. Bell rings. Braddock comes back, hardly breaking a sweat. He's got his rhythm down and his timing down. I told him don't go for the two-to-one combination yet. It's just an amateur fight. Get as much as you can out of these rounds, then knock him out on the fourth. He nods, gets the mouth guard back in, and goes on the sound of the second bell. This round is no different. Braddock testing things we were working on back in the gym. Braddock sways from a right hook and uppercuts Honey's chin, almost lifting this guy's feet off the floor. It sends him staggering back, and it's a good sign. Shows he's got a glass jaw, which we'll work on in the last round. Things went according to plan, but in the last 10 seconds, Honey throws one hell of a jab in Braddock's face, making a small cut on his cheek. Bell rings, the crowd goes crazy. I used the inswell on his face and tried to stitch his cut. We were lucky it wasn't too deep. He asked me if I noticed the glass jaw. I said I did. Brains as well as brawn, this Braddock. He started breathing heavily, and before the bell rang, he told me that punch was the hardest thing he ever felt in his life. Before I had the chance to think about that, the third bell rang. Right out the gate, Honey sent another punch, staggering Braddock. No more time to play around, I guess. He gets serious, starts throwing punches anywhere where he can hit. Braddock tries the uppercut, but Honey isn't stupid. He knows to avoid getting hit on his weak spot again. It's so astounding, this man looked like he needed to go to the hospital and now he's putting up a fight. He's still panting and sweating all the fluids out of his body, but if that's how he fights in this condition, I can't imagine what he'd be like in top condition. Every second, I felt like it could have been anyone's win, the game changing so suddenly. Bell rings, and Braddock comes back, 
breathing hard and sweating buckets. I'm trying to tell him to take some shots and wait for the opening so he can do the two to one. I couldn't quite hear him over the crowd, but he said that Honey started hissing at him. He'd never heard anything like that from a human. Last bell rings. Now every second a punch was thrown. I really thought that one of the two fighters were going to go down at any moment. Braddock was getting blitzed, Honey's arms like machine guns all of a sudden. Braddock was taking the hits well. His legs were shaking like an earthquake, but he stood tall. Then bam. The two to one shines through. Two hits on the jaw and Honey went down. The crowd went berserk. You know when something is so loud that everything else seems quiet? The ref starts counting, a little too slow if you ask me, but he might as well have been counting to a million because Honey was out cold. Braddock walked to me, winked and smiled. He knew he'd bagged his first victory. All of a sudden, the crowd started cheering and we both knew it wasn't for us. Braddock turned around and Honey was up on his feet, still breathing heavily and looking sick but not beat up. Not even a little punch weary. The way he glared at Braddock still gives me chills, silent amongst the screaming people circling them like a school of piranhas. The ref talks to the judges. Words were exchanged. I already knew what was going on. Honey gets unanimous decision number 51. Then the ref comes back and shouts one more round decides all. Mr. Suit and Ty didn't mention this. The crowd was so loud that I couldn't hear anything. Everything happened in slow motion, both fighters walking to the middle of the ring. Braddock looked determined, ready to become the next Ollie, the next Tyson. Honey stopped breathing, still as a statue. The only thing I hear is the ref saying to touch gloves. Braddock touches Honey's first. I remember looking at Honey's gloves, which were yellow and black, something I'd never really seen before. Then I saw them explode. Braddock went from hungry champion to babbling fool all in one moment, looking at his gloves and the blood soaking into them, oozing out of the holes Honey made. He falls to the floor and starts slithering backwards away from Honey. The only way I can describe what happened next is that he changed. Honey's gloves were now completely shredded by what had burst out of them, sharpened bone, I guess. I remember thinking of that horror movie where those kids get killed in their dreams. He was a hairless guy when he entered the ring, but now he was covered in thick black hair. In places I didn't even know people could have hair, I'd watched it grow out of his skin. God, I even saw his eyes change color, like the pupil had grown to make the whole eye black. I watched as he walked towards the retreating Braddock, his legs shrinking and loosening from his boots. Braddock tried to escape, but the crowd held him in place. I watched as Honey's newly emerged claw started slashing into Braddock's muscle. Muscle he spent a long time trying to gain, a physique that would have shocked the heavyweight, was now being sliced and clawed into like a knife against warm butter. It wasn't until I saw his bowels fall out that I processed what was happening. I yelled his name, tried to get into the ring, but the crowd pulled me back. Hands grabbed me, a thousand faces ready to rip into me like they were with poor Braddock. I had only one choice. During the night I was supposed to fight Bruno, I didn't tell the whole story. The reason I got into the fight was because I drew a gun on someone. I always kept that gun despite what it caused. Still do. The night of the Braddock fight, it paid off. I shot my way through the crowd, the pillars of legs stopping me any chance they got. Miraculously, I made it to the entrance. I looked back. I wish I hadn't. In the ring there were many of them. Some still looked human but others, not so much. I could see Honey, see his dark fur with a white streak on his back. I thought for a long time about what he reminded me of. With one bullet left, I shot the bouncer in the face before he had any inkling to what was going on downstairs. I ran to my car. I drove as if all of hell was chasing after me. As I was driving down the motorway, something popped into my head. Honey Badger. That's what he looked like. I know you'll think it's stupid, I sure do. But a honey badger killed Braddock. I will never, ever forget that I laughed to myself that night as I drove through the abyss, where creatures unknown were laughing back at me. That's the story.
This must have happened, what, 20 years ago? Since then, I closed the gym, got as far away from London as possible and spent years going back to those jobs I dreaded most, keeping to myself. The first few years were hard, when I wasn't working my ass off I'd come to my caravan and get drunk off my ass. Drown the bad thoughts out of my head, sweat them through my skin the next morning. I was close to shooting myself with the gun that saved my life. It did it again when it jammed on me. I must have made myself believe that it was a dream and it never happened because after that, I was fine. I stopped drinking, worked really hard and even found work at a gym overseas in sunny California. I'd always wanted to go and was hoping to go overseas when I was a boxer. As you know that didn't bode well with my creator, but all the money I slaved to earn got me a small little house in Anaheim. I started working for a small-time gym. The simplistic life has always suited me in the end. So maybe there's a question you've been asking yourself right now. I bet I can guess it to A.T. If I've been keeping it secret for so long, why suddenly tell the story now? Even admitting to killing? Well, let me tell you about another boxer. His name's Jackie Malfurs. Heard of him? If not, he was an upcoming heavyweight champion ready to fight in Vegas to claim the world title. I knew the kid, even came down with his coach to talk to the other aspiring boxers. During his latest fight, he was not the person I met at the gym. He froze, didn't fight at all then suddenly started lashing out, causing a major uproar and even losing his license to box ever again. I wondered what happened to him so I personally rang his coach up. The coach was baffled. He'd never told anyone but Jackie was talking about this mole thing and it was really freaking his coach out. If what happened to me was a dream, was Jackie dreaming something almost the same? I wish that was the case, but I doubt that. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not believe my story and I don't care, but heed my warning nonetheless, there are creatures among us, dwelling in our skin and blending into our lives. It could be the paper boy you see every morning. It could be your next door neighbor who always asks to borrow your lawn mower. It could be some lady broadcasting the weather. It could be anyone. If you believe me, don't do what I did. Don't spend most of your years away from people. Just be cautious, grow eyes on the back of your head and examine those close to you. They might have lived on this earth longer than us. They could be larger in numbers than us, but their cracks are starting to show and they're getting bigger by the day. Their cover will be shattered and exposed to the world. And when that happens, the darkness will cloud us and we won't know who our friends or enemies are. Just them, lurking in the obsidian. Smiling. 